Welcome back to Missing. I am Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic today. I hope everyone out there who's listening, they're doing as fantastic as I'm doing. Tim, we have our second part of this story that keeps on adding new layers to it. Really remarkable information that we have this time around. But before we get to that, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks a lot for asking. Yeah, I'm excited to share this update episode, and I hope you listen to part one that was released just a few days ago. In this episode, we speak with Suzanne, who is Patricia Lee Otto's daughter, and Patricia Lee Otto went missing from Lewiston, Idaho on August 31st, 1976. And we're also joined by Mel Jetterberg again. And Mel is an advocate for the Finley Creek Jane Doe, who was found on August 27th, 1978 near Elgin, Oregon. And so we speak about these two mysteries and whether or not they're in fact connected. And you did mention that there was a part one to this that previously aired a couple of days ago. If you haven't heard that, please go back and listen to that because, again, the story does have a lot of layers to it. It gets a little bit complicated at times, but that's sort of the thing you have to do is you go through all of the information for most missing person cases, and then you add a Jane Doe story to it. So uh, it is a really fascinating conversation, a really fascinating story. And Mel and Suzanne actually connected themselves with the Light the Way organization. And you can check out everything that Light the Way does at lightthewaymissing.com. They have several featured cases, this one being one of them. Absolutely. Yeah. Big thanks to the Light the Way folks, Shayna and Tates and everyone else over there. So follow us on social media at Missing CSM. And before we get to this conversation with Suzanne and Mel, we're going to break real quick for a commercial. So stick around. I'm Suzanne Timms, and I am the daughter of missing person Patricia Otto, and I joined forces with Mel two years ago in 2021, and we're here to just provide some updates. Absolutely, and my name is Melinda Jetterberg. I do go by Mel, and I am one of the lead researchers on the Finley Creek Jane Doe Task Force. It's a cold case I picked up several years ago in my hometown and just kind of an advocate and teammate with Suzanne. Great. And we spoke with you both and Jason Futch um, a little bit over a year ago. Um, I think it was the spring of 2022. But since then, you've connected with a wonderful advocacy group called Light the Way. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing with Light the Way? That's right, Tim. We actually joined forces with Light the Way because in addition to my mother's case, Mel and I both advocate for all missing um, persons, adults, and children. And a local case that I had been following is the Oakley Carlson case, who was a young girl who disappeared under the care of her biological parents after being placed in CPS care. And I had been following that case and suddenly Light the Way came onto the scene and I was just very impressed with the way that they advocated. And I thought, wow, that would be great to have somebody help with that part of it because Mel and I are both just brand new to this whole environment of advocating and the whole social media and reaching out to having the connections. So I reached out to them and said, Hey, how do I get my mom signed up for light the way? And that is how I met both the ladies, Shana and Tates with light the way. And first impressions of uh, both of them when you met them, I'm assuming you met them uh, via Zoom or it was a virtual meeting. What were your first impressions? We did. And one of the first things I thought was, wow, these two are some of the most creative and intelligent and big picture people I have ever met in my life because they think of these ideas that I just was blown away by. I never would have thought of myself. And sometimes that's what it takes is somebody from the outside who hasn't been involved in a project to just say, Hey, well, what about this thing? And you go, Oh yeah, that's a great point. And Tate's has done some of the best posters and graphic art type of things and all of that, that I could just never do and have no imagination and no time for, you know, quite frankly, So nothing but good to say about those two. I will echo that. And one of the things that they did um, right after connecting with them when Mel and I met virtually was they thought, why don't we campaign 
to actually reach out for people who worked with my father. Because my theory is that my father is responsible for my mother's disappearance. And we are so targeted on my mom and get getting information about my mom. And Light the Way had this genius idea to say, let's not, not target, but let's focus on my dad and get his picture out there and people who worked with him possibly to get that connection. Because that's what we're missing is this connection between Idaho and Oregon. How did my dad choose that spot or how did my mom end up in this spot? And that's what we've been working on for the last year with Light the Way is who worked with my dad, who knows things about my dad. And it's been incredible because because of these things, we have actually had a witness come forward that provided information that the police department previously did not have. So it's been incredible. Okay, wow. Um, so... I, I want to ask you more about what um, Light the Way, wh- what you and Light the Way did w- with um, your dad and and some of his old acquaintances. But um, first, I just want to ask about Finley Creek Jane Doe and um, your mom's missing case. So you believe that your mom is the Finley Creek Jane Doe? Is that correct? That is correct, and that just happened. You know, two years ago when we had met and discussed the case that. I ran across that forensic image that Mel and her team had created using the autopsy photos. And I initially thought the poster was literally me because it's my face. And it's this confusing like moment of why would somebody put me in an unidentified Jane Doe poster? And the minute you read the details, I realized this isn't describing me. It's perfectly describing my mother's height, weight, time of death, and then her clothing down to the white sleeveless blouse and red pants. And I'm like, the reason this woman looks like me is because it's not me, it's my mom. And the reason I would never put those two together is that I'd never been told I look anything like my mom. I didn't grow up hearing that, wow, you're a carbon copy of Patty because Patty was not mentioned. It was a forbidden, basically, word within our home. For people that aren't familiar with the case, that's why the two cases are linked together and where we're at in this journey to identify a woman who is missing after being missing, essentially. The Finley Creek Jane Doe, is she definitively a victim of homicide? We believe so. That's what it was ruled when they did the initial investigation because they weren't able to determine a cause of death or anything like that. And As we have pointed out before, there's no death certificate for her that says that. However, when you have a body that has clearly intentionally been buried, it, you know, the conclusion that they draw from that is that it is a homicide. Okay. And uh, geographically speaking, not impossible for um, Suzanne, your dad, to have taken your mom um, to Oregon. That's right. Even though it's across state lines, it's reasonable to think that he would drive that distance and get her across state lines, maybe in his mind, thinking that these two states aren't going to talk to each other, but it's it's a couple of hours away. It's not like I'm talking an eight hour drive. It's literally a couple of hours away. And we believe that that is the connection that we need to find is why would dad choose that area? He worked on forest roads. He had contracts throughout Montana, Idaho, Washington, Oregon. You know, Montana is much farther away. To drive to Montana is an eight-hour drive, and he did that for regular jobs. So why is it unreasonable that he had jobs in eastern Oregon two hours away, and he chose an area that he knew is not well-traveled? Right. And so your mom, Patricia, went missing in August of 1976, and Finley Creek Jane Doe was found about two years later, about 200 miles away in Elgin, Oregon, and of course, your mom went missing from Lewiston, Idaho. So, That's correct. Yeah, certainly a possibility. And the composite sketch of Finley Creek Jane Doe, as you've noted, um, definitely looks lo- looks like you. There is clearly some familiarity there. Where is this as far as law enforcement goes? I know you've you've tried to connect with them. I'm just curious if there are any uh, updates uh, there. Well, as far as Oregon law enforcement goes, it's been a bit hit or miss because technically in the books and on the records, this case is considered closed. There was a disposition given in 1990 that because they couldn't identify her, then they couldn't identify who had killed her. 
therefore case closed, evidence destroyed, body cremated, so on and so forth. And so we have, though, in the last couple of years met with the Union County District Attorney here. And she has said, if we are to dig up compelling evidence that we can figure out who this is and what happened to her, she is willing to reopen the case. And we've also been working with Sergeant Sean Belding from Oregon State Police. He is the major, major crimes sergeant. And we've had a meeting with him. He did come out to the last dog search that we did, which was a little over a year ago now. And he did make some promises to us of things that he was going to do on his end. Haven't heard from him since then, though. Not for lack of trying. Suzanne can talk about the Lewis MPD part. And as far as my mom's case, it's been an active and open investigation since she disappeared in 1976. However, after the Finley Creek Jane Doe was presented back in 1978, actually, Idaho went to Oregon and said, that's my girl, literally wearing the same clothes. That's got to be Patty Otto. Since that rule out, which they said at that time, the x-rays don't match, there has been really no movement in my mom's case since 1978. So it just kind of sat untouched for all these years. When I reached out in 2021 and said, look, they did a forensic image of that doe that you ruled out in 78. And that woman looks just like me. The teeth look just like my mom's and she's wearing the same clothes. I asked to have the dental records compared again. And what we discovered is that Finley Creek Jane Doe does not have an x-ray on file. Idaho did not have an x-ray on file for my mother. So Idaho had records in the national database and within NamUs and NCIC that they couldn't figure out where that information came from. And essentially the records they have completely rule her out of that body because the record says my mom doesn't have any wisdom teeth. So when we questioned how can you put something into a person's record with no documentation, no x-ray, no proof, how can you use that as a rule out they really can't explain that. So Idaho is more than happy to say, hey, we'll present her again. And fortunately, my sister, who is deceased from, since 2006, she had kept a copy of my mom's x-rays. So my sister had the only physical copy of the x-rays that is available for my mother. And it clearly shows she has all four wisdom teeth. So right now, my mom doesn't match her own national database record, which is completely asinine. So I provided a digital copy of that to both Idaho and to Oregon to do the comparison. And what we discovered within the Oregon case is that the Oregon record doesn't match what can be seen in the autopsy photos. So this case is just clearly so incorrectly labeled. There's information that's incorrectly labeled. There's even in one of Mel's records, it shows that the Finley Creek has a cap on her front tooth. You can see the pictures of her front teeth. She clearly does not have a cap on her front tooth. And when Dr. Brady, the medical examiner, ruled my mother out, he said it can't be her for the reason of these unerupted wisdom teeth, which means she has these wisdom teeth that haven't came through. That's also not correct. You can clearly see in the autopsy photos, you see three erupted wisdom teeth. So all these errors make it so difficult for Oregon to even say, Ooh, yikes, we have this case so backwards we can't even correctly identify her. Idaho's hands are tied because they're saying, hey, we told you that was Patty back in 1978. But Oregon has to be the one to admit we made a mistake. We didn't document this correctly. And we incorrectly ruled her out in 78. That's unlikely to happen. What organization is going to say, I made a mistake. Oops, my bad. Right. They can definitely be... Um be uh, tough to to change opinion especially when there's like an official ruling um but th this seems like there need you know it needs to be I, I don't i don't exactly know what needs to happen but i guess the the finley creek jane doe case would need to be reopened in this case and then they would need to start communicating with idaho again Potentially. And to do that, we would need some very compelling evidence to do that. So we have been trying to reach out to other organizations. For instance, I came across an organization called Face Lab based out of the UK and wrote them an email saying, here's the situation that we have regarding both Finley Creek Jane Doe and Patty Otto. Is there any way you could create 
an image or do an overlay of the photos of the skull versus pictures of Patty. And they said they'd be happy to take a look, but we need law enforcement to request this. And so Lewiston PD, Captain Clone, has said he will do that. So he's actually working with us to be able to do that. And really, the compelling evidence that the state of Oregon medical examiner currently wants is DNA. She really wants some DNA to be able to connect. To do that, we either need to have technology that can potentially extract DNA out of cremains, because we believe we've located those for Finley Creek Jane Doe, or we need to have a very, very thorough archaeological dig out at the site where Finley Creek Jane Doe's remains were found in order to locate the bones that were not recovered in 1978, because there were a few in the inventory that they did on the report, some of the bones were missing. So we feel like those are out there and there have been human remains detection dogs out there three times and located all three times. So we think those are out there, but it's going to take probably quite a bit of work and some time investment to find those things. So we're hoping we can do that in the next year or so. Wow. Yeah. That seems like there's still some, some hurdles there. Uh, DNA being a complication, but geez, I feel like they should be able to do more with the dental x-rays. Wouldn't that cancel the exclusion? We actually have an Idaho forensic odontologist who reviewed the dental x-rays of my mother and the photos of the Finley Creek Jane Doe. If, if they were to use the paper document, they're looking at a paper document that doesn't match the photos. So they need to stop looking at that paper and say, look, what they wrote is obviously a previous Jane Doe. We have confirmed that there was another body found. And how is it possible that they wrote the exact same 11 fillings on this Jane Doe who's found 28 days later? I mean, it's just clear what happened. He had in his mind, I have this skull. And that's what he describes when he rules my mom out and says, it can't be her. And he describes that other other skull. But uh, I do want to give a shout out to Oregon, though, because they did go back out to the site after the um, canines identified areas of interest. And after my father-in-law pointed out the area where he believed that the grave was found back in 1978, which that's a whole nother discussion. But the hunters that found the body in 1978 Later, by some weird twist of fate in 2010, I married this guy and have no idea that his family found a body in 1978. So my father-in-law went back up to the site, identified that he's saying that's where I believe the body was found. So Oregon does a dig on the area that my young father-in-law says 47 or 45 years ago, that's where I believe the body was found. That's like finding a needle in a haystack for him to remember the exact spot on the trail. If he's off by four feet, you know, they dug up the wrong spot. We want to dig where the dog is saying, the dog is saying here, here, and here. And instead, Oregon wanted to dig. That's where he said the body was at. And it lines up what he says where the body was lines up with the Finley Creek's documentation. You know, it's found so far off the road across a creek. It does line up. However, when you're talking a forest, how can you expect that a child is going to remember that's the exact spot where that body was at? And let's dig a hole here and expect to find something. Those remains could be a mile away. That arm could be a mile away from that area because there's scavengers out there. So our attempt to find this arm is like a needle in a haystack going out there to find a pelvic bone, an entire arm. Both hands are missing and I'm sure those bones were eaten by scavengers. So that chance is gone. But that pelvic bone gives me hope that that large pelvic bone, a bear, a wolf, they can't eat that pelvic bone. They carried it somewhere. Where is it? And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. And you mentioned what Light the Way helped you with in trying to locate um, old acquaintances of your dad. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, about this? Yeah. So because we believe that dad moved her body across state lines, what we're trying to figure out is, did he have a connection? Did he have a job over here in Oregon? Was he working with someone previously? And what Light the Way did was they created a kind of like a missing poster, but it was a looking for information poster. And it didn't just include dad's picture. It included the image of this, what do we call it, Mel? Franken? 
Franken the camper. Franken RV. Yeah, the Franken Frank RV. RV. Yeah. We call it a Franken RV because my dad essentially took a camper and a pickup and he welded them together to make his own, you know, handmade RV. And it's a very unique looking camper. The reason I'm so interested in this camper is that dad made the statement to family members that the night my mom disappeared, she went out to the camper and she stayed the night in the camper. And he says, I went back and checked on her in the morning and she had breakfast in the camper and then she left. In my mind, the only reason he's leading us to the camper is that neighbors saw him going in and out of the camper and he wants to explain why he was in and out of that camper in the wee hours in the morning. He doesn't, however, let the police department know any of that statement. He claims she left directly from the house. This is only family that he says this to. So I believe there's a half truth there that the camper was utilized and it makes sense if she's in the camper after he strangled her. If he takes that camper up to the sites where it's a rural forest road, no one's going to question why his camper's out there because he's done this for weeks on end. He would leave and stay at these forest areas on the roads where he's doing clearing and his camper was there. Nobody was, you know, questioning it. If he had my mom's little station wagon out there, people might question it and think you're squatting. If you're in an RV, they think you're camping or you're hunting. So I think that there is a link between this camper and how my mom's body was moved. So they have a picture of the camper from photos that I had with me and Natalie standing in front of the camper and they made this like missing person in seeking information poster and we circulated that and tips started coming in information started coming in and actually somebody who used to know my father back when he was in prison reached out to us and confirmed that my dad had confessed that he had killed my mother that he had buried her body that he had hid her body and obviously, we didn't have a confession from anybody. So this was new information that came from just circulating dad's information and getting his picture out and saying, hey, we're still seeking information on this. And now's a great time to bring it forward because, you know, nobody's going to get held accountable for it. My dad is long gone. You're not going to get held accountable for holding this information in because the reason this person kept it to themselves was they were fearful of my father. He would hired a hitman to kill people he knew. He would killed his wife. Are you going to run and tattle on him when he tells you this secret? No, she was frightened of him. She kept it to herself until her deathbed. And then she told her husband and her daughter, I am not dying with this lie, the secret on my heart. I've got to tell somebody. And she told two people and both people confirmed the same story. And what was the uh, situation where your father confessed to this person? He was in prison for the um, hitman because he had hired a hitman to kill the captain of the police force. And he was in prison and he was telling this woman, if I go to state prison, I'm going to die because they are going to do everything they can to ensure that I don't come out of here alive. And he said, I want you to know before I go in there, I did kill Patty. He was in a fit of rage and a fit of jealousy. I did kill her and I did hide her body. And he said, I don't want to die and have this on my heart. I need to tell somebody. And he told this woman who he confided in, who then kept that until her deathbed. What an unfair thing to do. Like, that's so, right. I don't want to have it on my heart anymore. So you're going to put the burden on someone else who had nothing to do with it? <laughs> Give it to someone else. Yep. <laughs> what a jerk. My God. So, and you believe this. This is, uh, this is credible. These people would have no reason to come forward. And it's also really interesting, which I don't know if I explained this before, if you go back to December of 1976, so mom disappeared in August of 76. In December of 1976, these are the same people involved when dad makes a phone call and says, you guys need to get the uh, attorney over here because they found Patty's body and there's a bunch of cops over here at the house and just send my attorney. These are the same people involved. So he trusted these people. This is the same person that he called saying, get my attorney. And they're like, Oh my God, Patty's body's in the yard. So they call the attorney, get my uncle over there to go find out what's going on. And my dad is hallucinating. The cops aren't there. They didn't find a body. He's just out of his mind, crawling around on the ground, hallucinating that he's seeing people, having conversations. And that night they take him and put him into a mental hospital and say he's losing his mind. What's really happening is he's racked with guilt and he's intoxicated 
and the truth is coming out and he's hallucinating these things. Why would you hallucinate that they found your wife's body and you were going to prison? Why would you be wanting your attorney and all this stuff? Why wouldn't you be thinking, oh, my God, who killed my wife? Because he knows exactly what happened. So how is this, if any way, used in any sort of legal context? Because it's a secondhand, essentially a secondhand confession. You know, if it had been Shirley herself who had given this information to police, it would be a different, um, they would have different weight to it. This is literally her child and her husband saying, oh, yeah, she told me the same story. So it's secondhand confession. And the fact that my father's dead, there is no prosecution. So it's it doesn't really matter what he said or whether or not we prove it. We're not prosecuting him. We're not prosecuting a dead man. So what, why does it really matter at this point? Why can't we just say everybody knows what happened? All I want is an identification. I don't want prosecution. I just want closure. Yeah. And d- does any of these new revelations count as uh, the, the evidence needed to reopen the case? Well, that's mom's case. Remember, mom's case never yeah. closed. So it's like, hey, right. Idaho's like, yeah, this is great. This is perfect. We'll share it with Oregon. But with Oregon putting up their stops that we have a closed case until we get DNA evidence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To prove that. To uh... prove that it's her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, any any evidence like like this uh, confessions, they're not going to matter. What can be done, though, is Lewiston can take those contacts and dig further, right? So if you talk to this person, they may lead you to another person. They may need, lead you to a location so that we can find that tangible stuff, right? We need to find a connection between Ralph and the state of Oregon or Ralph and some other third person in the state of Oregon. So I feel like if they were to take those leads and run with them, yeah, right now they might not have any legal weight, but those are tools that they can use to find other people, find more evidence and create this chain that we need to draw, right? We need to draw the line between Patty and Finley Creek Jane Doe and Ralph and just, all these pieces of this web need to be put together. So while it might not have any legal legal standing as it looks, a deathbed confession, it's like, well, go talk to her child and her husband and find out if she said anything else. Did she mention anybody else? Did she mention a location? It may not have seemed important at the time, but if they can glean those little nuggets out of there, they can run those down, you would think. Now, this camper slash RV that you mentioned, um, I, I take it it's it's mobile. You could you could pull it, I guess, uh, drive it around. Um, and so where is that now? It is at a known location. And thanks to all of our investigative work and the help of the previous prosecuting attorney on my father's attempted murder charge, um, I got a hold of him and he was so excited to think, man, not only did my father get away with murdering my mother and everybody in town knew it, he then got away with attempting to kill the captain of the police department because he did that, hired the cop, paid the cop, was ready for the murder to happen, had his alibi, was planning to leave town. And then he found out it was a cop that he hired. It wasn't a real hit man. That was a cop. So the police department has this like grudge against my father of he got away with a lot, right? So the, the police department and the prosecuting attorney, they are gung-ho to say, I'll do whatever I can to help you. We 100% believe that your father was responsible and that he took this to his grave. What can we do? So he reached out to the Clearwater County um, pr- prosecuting attorney and had this conversation about this camper, Franken RV, is in their possession in their county. Can we just get it and do a cadaver search? Can we bring the canine in and do a cadaver search on it? And we're struggling getting them to issue a search warrant. So we could just go and get it. I have the ability to go buy that camper back and take it. But if I do that and the dog hits, I've now contaminated the chain of evidence. I've potentially put something in there to have the dog alert. You know, I could potentially be involved in it. So I don't want to mess that up. I don't want to take that chance that that one piece could be ruined. So we're just kind of going back and forth with Clearwater County to say, if that's the one little piece of evidence that we have, what if there's what if there's something on the camper that would link the camper to Oregon? What if there's certain species of plants that are still on that 
pollen or something on the camper. I don't know. I'm not a biologist, but I'm like, can they somehow connect that camper and say that camper was somehow contaminated to a dead body because the dog is alerting saying there was a dead body in this camper. And it also has pollen from Eastern Oregon that the owner can't explain why the owner who happens to be a previous lover of my father's who has kept this camper in her possession and refuses to let anyone inside the camper, use the camper, do anything with the camper for 47 years. It seems very suspicious, but apparently it's not suspicious enough for Clearwater County to get involved and issue a search warrant. Did they give you any information on why they can't issue a search warrant? I mean, it feels like it feels like this is obvious. Lance, I am just beyond I'm beyond frustrated. And now you have to think of this too. Clearwater County just happens to be the same place that my father died in police custody. So my dad was in police custody of Clearwater County when he died. And I don't know if they just want to wash their hands of it. They don't want to get involved. They will not give a really definitive. They just said, we don't have enough for a search warrant. Why don't you approach her and see if you can purchase it privately? They know that's going to ruin the chain of command. They know that would ruin my chances of doing anything. They suggested they suggested that to you, like you go, you should purchase this. You you do it on your own. You you yeah yeah. Well, and we she can purchase it. We'll help her do that. We want that camper. However, we don't have anywhere to take it. It's got to be stored somewhere where it's safe. Suzanne again can't be anywhere near that camper. She can't. She can't do it. So we de- we're stuck. Nobody wants to help us help facilitate us. We would even figure out how to tow it where it needs to go, but we don't have anywhere to take it where it's going to be safe. Also, it's in the possession of your father, one of your father's ex-lovers, and she hasn't allowed anybody to do anything with this for 47 years. So there's no guarantee that she would even sell it to you, right? (laughs) I, I don't I don't want to like give my secrets away, but we have a um, clandestine mission on how we're going to get it. And she doesn't know it's me. Yeah. The, the other thing that's come across my mind is I don't know why I haven't had the balls to just call this lady and say, listen, listen how suspicious this is. While my dad is in prison for attempting to murder a cop because he didn't want to get busted for killing my mom, she shoots her husband in the face and he lives. She shoots him in the face. She's trying to get rid of her husband. Clearwater County finds all these love letters from my father from the prison. So she's in communication with my dad and he's trying to hand over custody of me and my sister to this murdering woman while he's in prison. I don't make this up. I swear to God, I have the letters. I can show them to you. So this woman is someone who my dad was either playing her which I think he was playing her because she had property and she had things he wanted. So she was willing to go the extra mile and do things for my father. She was trying to impress my father. She loved him and wanted to spend the rest of her life with him. Unfortunately, her husband survived that gunshot wound to the face. When dad gets out of prison, he does not hook back up with this woman. He does not. He moves on to some other prey. So I think she's a woman scorn. And I think she's been holding on to the secret because I think she may have been involved. I think she could have been the reason how that camper got moved from Lewiston to up that rattlesnake grade. I don't think he drove it. I think she drove it. And I think that's why she doesn't want anybody to touch it. And she doesn't want anything to anybody to have anything to do with it because she herself could have involvement. And that makes more sense than my father, who's high on Valium, completely drunk and falling down all the time. How did he drive that road and get back safely in a camper under his conditions? Right. And and this woman is not uh, the woman who gave the deathbed confession about here. And, and so this woman is still alive. Wow. So I guess she could be interviewed by the police in Idaho, right? Right. The, right. right? I mean, she could be a witness. Why don't they just bring her in and talk to her and say, hey, you were in communication with a guy who was in prison, believed to have murdered his wife, known to have attempted to murder while you're trying to murder your husband. Tell me about that relationship. You're going to tell me that they just quietly went their own ways and there was nothing exchanged? Why is he giving her property? Why did he also buy her a brand new car and she still has that brand new car that she's kept all these years? It's almost as if he paid her hush money to keep this secret quiet 
And she willingly kept it quiet knowing, hmm, I got something out of the deal. Can you give a little background on the area, like the community, how big it is, who knows who? It's so small, Lance. It is so small. The reason that this person is like a potential witness in this case is because her own family came to me and said, my grandma's got something to do with your mom's disappearance. And I'm like, what? I stayed with that woman for a summer. I'm like, wait, I need to know more details. The, the family suspects this woman. It is a very small community, probably less than a thousand people. It's that tiny. It's less than a thousand people. And we believe the connection with her and my father is when my father was a child growing up in Craigmont, Idaho, they left Craigmont and moved to this tiny community called Weipe, Idaho. And they had property next door to each other. So they knew each other as very, very young children. And I think this probably relationship, a sexual relationship in nature, had gone on for decades when they were very young. And that's discussed in the letters that dad is writing to Jan in prison. He talks about how this has been going on for a long, long time. I thought this case was complicated the first time we spoke with you. Oh, jeez. My gosh, more sort of um, angles to it than uh, than before. It's it's unbelievable. It's very complex and very frustrating knowing that, like, why can't I just call her up? I said, why can't I just call her up and wear a wire? And I asked her what she knows about it. And the police department told me it doesn't work that way. You can't just go in and put a wire on somebody. And I said, why not? You did it to my father. That's how they busted him for the Hitman, they put a wire on the cop and walked in there and they did it to my father. So why can't I do it to her? They said I could talk to anybody, but not her. I can talk to any witness, but not her. I was directed not to speak with her because she's dangerous. We have asked them to do it. We've asked Lewis and PD to do it. They still haven't yet, but hopefully they will before she dies because she's old. <laughs> is she still in the town or is she she's a little bit outside now? She's in the same place that... She had lived in when she was a child and she owns that property and has like hundreds of acres of land in the same location that she's always been in. Wow. Very much a hermit does not get out. I'm not worried about her hearing this and knowing that I am who I am. She might not even know I changed my name. She's, you know, completely cut off from the world, cut off from her children. She's, she's not a loving, warm person. Mm -hmm. And when you ask the, uh, you said you asked the Lewiston Police Department if they could go and speak with her and they haven't done it yet. But what was their answer? Did they say we will do it eventually or or she's too dangerous for us as well? No, the answer that I got was, do you want me to put my officer at risk to go up there and talk to a woman who's already shot her own husband? And I said, she's 88 years old. That is your job to talk to people who are witnesses. I don't care if you're scared. I'm not kidding. That's insane. I, I I mean I use this metaphor all the time. Like that that's like going into a restaurant, the cook telling you that he doesn't he's choosing not to be uh like cook your food today because he might get burned. Like that's what you take on as as the job of being a police officer. What what is wrong with these people? You want to put my officer at risk? No, you're this is your your mom. <laughs> it's not like it's your story, not theirs. And then when I offer, I'll do it. I say, I'll do it then. I'll wire myself up and I'll go in. And they just said that it's just not, that's not how it works. You can't do that. And, you know, you'd have to have substantial enough information. And I'm like, isn't this substantial enough information? She's communicating to my father in prison while she's married and tries to kill her husband. Why isn't that enough to be like, this is suspicious. This looks like a, they planned this out because they were trying to be together kind of thing. Yeah, that seems like it's certainly possible. Also, though, so Idaho is a one party consent state. So I don't, there's really nothing stopping you from making a phone call and recording that and delivering that to the Lewiston police because maybe that could get them to uh, act if she says something on. And if you just interview her and don't approach her aggressively, I, I think the advice to not approach her physically is probably good advice, it sounds like. But. A phone call could could work. I have had this conversation with many with many people, including Mel, that I'm like, how much whiskey is it going to take for me to just make that phone call and be like, hey, remember me? Do you remember my dad, Ralph Otto, that guy you were in love with back in 1976? I don't know what stops me. Is it because I am so compliant that because I was told 
not by this detective, the previous detective who did nothing for my mom's case. Previ- previous detective just basically said, I can't do anything. This one, Jeff has kind of said like, well, let's talk to Clearwater County. So he's not the one who's putting the brakes on it as previous. But I, I do think that that would be the next step is that I've just got to make that call and say, what if she wants to get it off her chest? She's got to be like 88 years old. You know, and what I've been told yeah. is that these women that hold these secrets, they don't want to go to the grave carrying something like this because they don't know what's going to happen if they're not honest and, you know, bring this information out that needs to come to light. Maybe I need a New Year's resolution. <laughs> Mel, you should call and just say that you're Suzanne. Well, that's a brilliant idea, actually. I can't believe one of us didn't think of that before because what we had thought of myself and her cousin Jen and our friend Margaret, who are all working on this, we've offered to, you know, let's let's all get in a room, be on speakerphone, take a shot, go, Suzanne. Do it. <laughs> that sounds but like just as good an idea. The, I hadn't thought of the uh, someone else being Suzanne Somebody on the phone. Be me. I hadn't thought of that. That's a great idea. And you can all still be in the in a room and and you can do the shot and you know just to take the edge off but <laughs> I feel like you're right about this woman wanting to get it off her chest. I I feel like she's probably even thinking about her life and how it's turned into this all-consuming secret. And and it's probably to the point of this compulsion, right? Like it's almost like a, a, a hoarding compulsion where she can't let go of anything now because something might have something to do with an answer that would lead to her and, and, and punishment. But what what's the punishment at this point, I guess, is the other side of that that conversation, you know, at 88. By the time this even gets to any sort of trial, She's not going to be fit. Yeah, nobody would ever put her on trial. They would just say, yeah. just give us the information. Tell us you were involved. Tell us that how the body got there. And maybe that's all we need to close the case is just for her to say, look, he, he was in a you know drunken state that night and he called me because we know he called two other friends and they both said, not tonight, call me in the morning. He needed help because he physically couldn't do it himself. He called someone and I'm really pointing to her. I couldn't imagine living with that for almost 50 years. I don't know. It has to feel so weird to consider not having that weighing you down anymore. One vote from Lance. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I definitely vote uh, vote Two to votes. call her too. But yeah, I mean, I guess we don't know, right? Like, what if she was more culpable than we than we realize, um, you know, or... or you know, what if there's something else going on on her property that she's still fearful of, you know, that yes. we're not seeing right now, you know? Yes. That's a good Here. point because we're all envisioning her to be this like frail old lady. She might have a, a shotgun by her door or something, you know? She packs a twenty two in her belt. There you go. She still packs a gun in her belt, according to her family. And I'm like, that is one badass grandma. 88 years old and you're packing a weapon because you got to protect yourself. That's... That's interesting. Yeah, she's protecting herself and and I guess 100 acres of property you said, 100 about 100 acres. So I don't know, it could be a lot of secrets buried on that property. Yes, there could be. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors and now we're back to the program. Well, the police have to do something. You would think. How can they just ignore it for 47 years? How can they just pretend like nothing happened and ignore it? I, I don't know. But how can you also take a homicide case and close it and dispose of it and have no record? I don't know. Apparently, they can do whatever they want to do because nobody's certainly answering as to how you can take a homicide case, which she did not bury herself. She did not kill herself and get under the ground somehow. And close the case, even though there's no statute of limitations. So our hands are kind of tied at this point, but we're not giving up. Yeah. Where do you both go from here? What do you think, Mel? We have things up our sleeve right now that we're working on. And we do. We're really hoping that Face Lab, Face Lab is the UK group that Mel mentioned. And basically it's using computer technology to take that skull of the Jane Doe and to take my mother's photos and to show that these two people are the same people. We have yep. the dental x-ray of my mother and we have images of all the teeth. Why can't science link these two together and create a 3D mold from the photos and a 3D mold from her x-ray and say, these are the same teeth. I believe technology is there or it's coming and we're not going to give up on the fact that 
DNA has been extracted from the tiniest, minutest amount. Like they've done where a person leaves a room and they can collect the DNA in the air. If your DNA is in the air, is it possible that her DNA is in the trees? Mm -hmm. You know, how would my mom's DNA be in those trees unless her body decomposed in the soil around that? So I'm still holding out that science is going to back us and that we're going to get the the evidence that we need to prove it's her. I haven't seen anything that we've come across or anything that we've uncovered that leads me to believe that this is someone else who just happens to look exactly like me wearing my mother's clothing at the same time that my mother disappeared. I haven't came across anything that leads me away from it. Yeah, that is a really great point. And I feel like we, I don't feel like we are at a standstill necessarily. It just takes time for things to happen. So we, at this point, I'm, I'm still pushing the state of Oregon to throw in a few more resources around continuing to excavate that area. However, if they're not willing to do that, we have quite a following who we could maybe recruit other professionals from there. We, that's another thing like the way is done is put us into contact with people on y'all side of the country to maybe come and volunteer their services. And we've had a really great working relationship with the owners of the property out there. So it would, I feel like they would let us do what we needed to do. However, it is an active logging property. So that is something that's going to have to be done sooner rather than later. It just takes time to arrange those things. So, you know, we've got the cremains that we still have. Hopefully something can be done with those. If we can find any kind of DNA out there, most of this, the skull, when it was found, most of the hair was gone. So where did that hair go? Right. There is biological matter out there from this body. And if you were to look at the terrain, yeah, it's a hillside, but it also kind of ends in a bowl. So it's, it's, it's in there. It's in this kind of controlled area. We just need to have the resources to find the things and dig up the things and extract DNA. The other thing that I'm doing on Finley Creek Jane Doe side is actively working on other rule outs, right? So if you go to NamUs, you'll see that there are rule outs of all kinds on there. I, as the admin of her socials, get suggestions all the time. So my thought is the more I rule out these other women, that's, that's you know, okay, getting closer and closer. It's not her, it's not her, it's not her. One of the problems that we're running into, and this is one of the things I kind of wanted to throw out there, is when you're dealing with charts and things like that from the 70s, record keeping, not great. So I, I have been running into kind of one of the tandem things we have been doing is working on getting things corrected in NamUs because there are a lot of people like us who kind of rely on NamUs as this fountain of information. Oh, there's dental records available. So go ahead and compare. Well, I have an example here recently of this woman. Her name is Nancy Perry Baird, who kept getting suggested to me over and over and over again. Because if you look at her picture, she looks very much like Finley Creek Jane Doe as well. And if you go to NamUs, it says she's got dental records. Well, Suzanne and I have seen her dental records. There's nothing on them. It's four pieces of paper that are blank, which, you know, you could derive from that. Oh, so she had no dental work done, right? Well, her name's not even on them. So what kind of evidence is that? Oh, these are Nancy Berry's dental records. Prove it. Her name's not even on them. So that's the kind of stuff we're working with where it's like, okay, <laughs> how, how do we, how do we do this? So, I mean, and I have been working with Dr. Vance also, she's the one who can actually submit updates to the NamUs profile for the state of Oregon. So I've actually been working with her to make some corrections to the Finley Creek Jane Doe profile and make sure that people that have definitely been ruled out recently are put in there. So it's just all these little pieces that if we can just put together this compelling 
circumstantial case until we can find the physical evidence, we will do that. I, I have a feeling when we finally get the breakthrough, we're going to have just this huge mountain of things that is our proof. And we just need the cherry on top is going to be some kind of physical connection. Man, at, at this point, like there are so many layers to this story to like both of these stories, but it just feels like it can get overwhelming. If you get too deep into it, do you have some techniques that you apply to maybe take your mind off of it for a little bit or, or is it pretty much full time all the time? I think I would say that the way that I've been able to get through all these deaths that I've experienced is I didn't cause this. I'm not the reason that I'm in this position. And I think that people take it to the point that they think they're responsible and that it's only them that's going to be able to solve it. And I tend to lean on, it's going to be science that's going to solve it. It's not me that's going to solve it. I'm just simply a tool that's being used. So rather than carrying the weight of the case, I have a lot of other resources like Light the Way and like Mel and like our followers. I'm not doing this alone. And people who are in this situation need to admit that and accept They're not doing this alone and they are not responsible. If I took on the weight of my mom's disappearance, my father's death, my sister's murder, I mean, my sister's death with her husband and her child and my friend, my son's death. If I took that weight on and I really thought I'm responsible for these, I couldn't move another step. But if I look at it like if I can lighten somebody else's load, if we can make differences in the way that Doe cases are handled, And if I can make differences in the way other missing persons cases are handled, I'm turning a negative into a positive and I'm not carrying it. I'm literally unloading it. Which is kind of poetic because it's the opposite of what your father did when he told this woman that he needed to get it off his chest. He did that from a selfish point of view. And this is completely the opposite. So really amazing to hear. Thank you. I'm not my father, Lance. (laughs) I'm glad. (laughs) So is my husband. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> wow. Well, yeah, thank you both for uh for joining us here today. This is uh this is a great update um to two very complicated cases and uh yeah, please keep in touch and let us know um if there's anything we can do to help. Is is there um a GoFundMe? I know we we talked about this a little bit last time. Are are you still raising money for um for any searches or anything? I think as far as searches are concerned, that part is voluntary. Um, But I did notice that the kind of industry standard for DNA extraction has gone up by about $1,500. So yeah, I know. So I mean, we can always use contributions simply because we print off flyers, we use gas money, You know, this, when Patty's birthday passed this last time, we did a timeline and myself and our friend Margaret went out to the Finley Creek site and we had printed off flyers and I was nailing Ralph's face to trees out there, you know, and that kind of thing costs money. So we're on Cash App, we're on Venmo. We actually have a Banner Bank account set up just for the Finley Creek Jane Doe because we were doing the DNA extraction. So any Banner Bank, they can go in and donate to the Finley Creek Jane Doe. Um, It's a nonprofit account. And those funds are used for the DNA, which we did the testing twice. And then we also used it for my mom's 70th birthday celebration where we made signs and posters and bring in awareness. And like Mel said, those things cost money. And yes, we could foot all that expense, but by having people contribute, it feels like we are solving this, not me solving this. So we appreciate those donations. 